So we'll come on to the final session. And uh, at past conferences, we've had uh, Bill Browder and uh, Jameson Firestone uh, independently at separate conferences, one in Miami, one in London, speak about the Sergei Magnitsky case. It's very well reported. Uh, case, I'm sure most or all of you uh, know the gist of, of the case. For those who don't, uh, Sergei Magnitsky was a Russian tax accountant for the Moscow law firm of Firestone Duncan. That's uh, Jameson's former company. Uh, Sergei was arrested in 2008, and he died after 11 months in police custody in Russia. Uh, since then, uh, American-born British investor Bill Browder, who was spoken previously, as I mentioned, uh, who was a client of Firestone Duncan's, uh, has gone on a very high-profile campaign uh, alleging that Sergei uh, was a whistleblower who was essentially beaten to death and generally abused and tortured uh, by Russian police. Browder claims that uh, Magnitsky discovered that uh, powerful Russian figures, uh, including uh, law enforcement, uh, had uh, essentially stolen corporate seals during a raid on the offices of Firestone Duncan um, and used those seals or uh, had otherwise uh, misappropriated those companies uh, and essentially perpetrated a $230 million tax refund fraud against the Russian government. Browder's narrative is that Sergei was a whistleblower who had filed a criminal complaint. He was arrested, abused, um, and he ultimately, you know, was killed or, or certainly died. And... Uh, uh, and this is, uh, you know, a horrible thing. Um, Bill Browder has written a, a book. Um, he has uh, spoken at conferences. Uh, he has played a leading role in legislation getting passed, um, including the Magnitsky Act in the United States that's directly aimed at, um, I think it's 18 Russians or, or thereabouts, uh, who were implicated in uh, uh, the, the, the alleged crimes that uh, Mr. Browder has uh, spoken about. Um, Russia retaliated by uh, banning the U.S. adoption of Russian children and uh, banning 18 Americans from entering Russia, including uh, someone who's spoken three times at our prior events, uh, Greg Coleman, a retired FBI agent, um, over the last few years, uh, an alternative narrative has, has, uh, has, has arisen. And at first blush, you know, I've never investigated the Magnitsky case. At first blush, I sort of, uh, I sort of maybe dismissed the, these counter arguments, maybe as sort of, you know, I didn't really know how credible they were. It, it, it was incredible to me that these laws had been passed and, and journalists had written all of these stories uh, that more or less had the same uh, uh, narrative that was, was the same narrative that Bill Browder was alleging. You know, it just seemed incredible to me that they could all have been wrong and, uh, and, and these uh, counter-arguments um, uh, that were appearing, you know, were right. Uh, so I, I did some research. I spoke to a few people and I made a determination that um, it was certainly worth uh, a public airing, uh, you know, to try and determine uh, what is fact and what is fiction. Because if this sort of counter-narrative is accurate, it's probably one of the most extraordinary things that uh, uh, I've ever sort of witnessed, you know, because it would mean that these laws have been passed based on uh, suspect uh, information and that all of these uh, stories written by major news organizations uh, were sort of guilty of not doing proper research. So, you know, the purpose of this session is really, you know, let's try and sort out, you know, what is kooky, what isn't kooky, what's real, what isn't real. 
you know, is, is there any credibility to, to this uh, counter-argument that's uh, come up in recent months? So, on stage, we have uh, Sergei's uh, former boss, uh, Jameson Firestone, who's at the far end. We have, uh, sitting next to him, uh, Russian filmmaker Andrei Nekrasov. And sitting next to him, we have American journalist Lucy Commissar. So essentially, you know, I'm a neutral moderator. Uh, Lucy and Andre are basically of the uh, opinion that this official narrative is simply not accurate. And Jameson is more or less of the opinion that the, the, the you know, the narrative, the commonly accepted narrative is indeed accurate. And and these, this sort of counter argument has no no basis, and and perhaps is, you know, is a bit kooky. I'm sure that's going to be his argument. So we have diverse opinions here. So Lucy is going to kick us off with with really why the official narrative uh, should not be accepted. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, talk about the tax evasion part, and Andre will talk about the uh, tax refund fraud and, and Magnitsky's death. Uh, we divided it so we don't repeat each other. Uh, uh, this is a really a very good coda to an event that deals with offshore corruption, because when I started uh, investigating Browder about 20 years ago, that's why I did it. Uh, he and his partners, including Kenneth Dart of Dart Cups, had bought the Russian titanium company of Visma from Mikhail Khodorkovsky, and they continued his transfer pricing scheme uh, on the Isle of Man, run by the infamous Peter Bond, many of you have heard of him, to cheat minority partners of dividends and the Russians of taxes. They, they settled uh, with uh, Peter Bond because there's no honor among thieves, and he uh, when they, they bought the... Uh, uh, the Browder people with uh, Dart bought the company from Khodorkovsky. Peter Bond was stealing the rake off, and they, they sued him in the Isle of Man, and they actually said, this project is only useful to us for the profits we will get from the rake off. Then uh, a Visma was sold to a Russian company, VSMPO, and the lawyer found out, found these papers and said, they cheated my client. He filed a, a, a New Jersey RICO suit, and uh, Browder and his partners settled. But, but by then, um, and I wrote about this on, uh, for 100 reporters, 100r.org, I knew from there that, that Browder was a crook, and it made me interested in following this story. So let's look into his offshore uh, system, which was mostly Mossack Fonseca shell companies, and it's how he built his entire uh, hermitage network, uh, Mossack Fonseca, Cypress shells, and Russia shells. So in uh, 1995... Uh, he incorporated uh, Berkeley Advisors, which was, oops, how did that happen? Oops, this went backwards. Sorry about that. I, I think the order seems to have been, uh, okay. That was Berkeley Advisors, but the, the rest of it. Um, yeah, I think he, you, you changed the, uh, the system, and then I, it seems to have disappeared. Well, I'll talk about it, and then you can, you can see the pictures. He set up uh, uh, offshore Berkeley Advisors, uh, which was a BVI entity, and then in 96, he created uh, Hermitage Capital Management, an investment firm re uh, registered in Guernsey by Mosek Fonseca, and it's, uh, he set up his subsidiary, uh, the Hermitage Fund. His initial investors were Edmund Safra, a banker uh, that, that owned Republic National Bank, and Benny Steinmetz, and they also invested through Mossack Fonseca shells. What are you looking for? The blue strip. Okay. Uh, but, uh, what I was showing you were the registration, the documents of those uh, Mossack Fonseca shell companies. And the uh, Safra uh, shell was at uh, his... Uh, Mosak, uh, his, at his Republic National Bank building in Guernsey, and the other partner was uh, Benny Steinmetz, and he, all, he had Wiltonia Investment, and that was at the same address. Uh, Safra died in 99 in a very suspicious fire 
and Steinmetz has now uh, been charged by various governments with uh, bribery uh, uh, to get uh, m mining rights. Uh, then uh, Browder also uh, then used Berkeley advisors to hold shares in Hermitage Capital uh, and made Mossack Fonseca his registered agent in 97, and he retained it to build an offshore network in Cyprus. The Cyprus shells were Glendora and Cone, and they would own the Russian shells, Saturn and Dalnea Steppa, and uh, they held the Russian shares that Browder was buying. Now, HSBC management Guernsey was the investment manager of the Hermitage Fund. Uh, Browder was given the instructions and was listed as the investment advisor. The HSBC private bank Guernsey was the trustee and nominee shareholder of the Hermitage Fund. And as trustee through Glendora and Cone in Cyprus, it owned Hermitage portfolio companies, Ryland, Park, Fenian, and Macon. They were the Moscow shells that would be famous as the companies that were allegedly stolen to use in a tax refund fraud that Andre will discuss. As he was setting up his offshore network, Browder in 1998 gave up his citizenship to take a British passport. As we know, the UK, unlike the US, does not tax offshore profits, and all his money was going offshore. He didn't want to pay American taxes. So uh, Americans who repudiate their citizenship have to prove it wasn't to evade taxes or file for the next 10 years. I don't know if uh, Browder did that. I asked the uh, IRS uh, representative uh, yesterday if he knew about it, and he gave me a name that I could contact. Uh, when HSBC bought Republic Bank in 1999, uh, Browder effected some share deals over the Safra Holdings, and Steinmetz sold out to Browder in 2000. So in the end, by 2000, Browder effectively uh, owned the company uh, no longer uh, with uh, Safra and Steinmetz. Uh, his, maiden, his new partners were the Ziff brothers, and they invested through Cypress Shells, uh, Joda, Giggs Enterprises, and uh, Peninsula Heights Limited. That was connected to Speedwagon Investments, one and two in New York and Delaware. Browder is listed on the filings uh, showing that he played a role, and then the Ziff Cypress Shells created another layer of front companies, including Kamea in Russia, uh, in, uh, in the Kalmykia region, where Browder shells were also registered. So uh, then in 2007, Browder set up Starcliff SA to replace Berkeley Advisors. It was registered by Mosek Fonseca in the BVI. So Browder could probably run an advertisement for how wonderful Mosek Fonseca is if you want to hide from uh, hide your money from uh, tax accountants, uh, uh, authorities, uh, your uh, minority investors, and, and so, so on. Are you looking for this? Well, why can't you put the uh, presentation? It's not loading on the stick, and we had it on before. Can't you go use the old one? Um, well, I, I don't know how to do that. You want to copy? I have it up there if you want to take it off. Sure, I'll take it. I'll just go on because I don't want to take up everybody's, take all the time. So to be complete about Mosak Fonseca, uh, Jameson Firestone, the co-founder of Firestone Duncan, also appears in the Panama Papers uh, in the database that was leaked. 
shows Mosa Fonseca set up Firestone Financial Inc. in 1987 and Firestone Management in 1988, both in Panama with his London properties, 34 Pembridge Gardens and 3 Lauderdale Road as the registered address. So it's a one big happy <coughs> Mossack. Oh, it's actually going. Well, let's see. Okay, so this is the one that is the Berkeley advisor. It's, it's the British Virgin Islands, Mossack Fonseca, the arrow points from Mossack Fonseca. And that as an early one. This is Glendora in Cyprus. And if you look at the yellow marks, you can see uh, that, that he, oh, sorry. <laughs> if you look at the yellow marks, you can see that uh, he is, Hermitage is the, the one in the middle and the one underneath uh, is Republic Bank. Uh, Browder is listed on the Joda, that was the Ziff brothers, and you see that he is listed on the, the Joda filing. Uh, and this is the um, notes for the financial statement which indicate that Starcliff is incorporated British Virgin Islands and is owned, owned by Hermitage. So the point really is to show you that uh, the, he really has all of these Mossack Fonseca shells, that uh, the, the documents are there, I have the documents, uh, and all of the reporters that uh, seem to have missed the fact that he had these shells when there was so much reporting about Mossack Fonseca, Panama Papers, should uh, ask themselves some questions, and you, you could wonder, too, why they ignored him, because he's a pretty famous guy, and they were writing a lot about famous guys with Mossack Fonseca shell companies, and he's the poster boy for Mossack Fonseca shell companies. Now, this, then the question is, how was he using this? And uh, as you know, you're not surprised, a lot of it was tax evasion. You need accountants to run offshore tax evasion and enter Sergei Magnitsky. He had gone to the Russian Economics Academy with Konstantin Ponomarov, who first got him a job with Ernst & Young, where Ponomarov was working. Then, when with a Jamie, Fire I'm sorry, Jameson, don't want to be too familiar. <laughs> uh, Ponomarov set up Firestone Duncan with Mr. Firestone. He hired uh, him, uh, Ponomarov hired uh, Sergei Magnitsky and assigned him the Hermitage account. He told me that back in 96, Sergei was in charge of all accounting and tax filing for all the Hermitage companies. He told me that it was done through shell companies registered in Russia at 301 Lenina Street, Elista, the Republic of Kalmykia, where there, more, there were more than a thousand other shell companies registered. So you know the drill about that. Uh, Kalmykia, which is where uh, the Russian shells were registered, offered some big tax write-offs. Ponomarov explained that if a legal entity, even with three employees, uh, had more than 50% of them disabled, uh, they had to pay zero instead of 28% VAT, zero instead of 2% property tax. And you, you can see the numbers there. Uh, the Russians there had apparently done it partly for uh, veterans of the Afghanistan wars that were disabled and for other disabled people. So the, the, the reduction on corporate taxes would come to about 50%. He said, in other words, with the discount for locating the company in Kalmykia, the tax bill was reduced to 5.5%. We started to offer this to our clients, including to Bill. But here's the scam. Browder stock companies there, Saturn... Invest and uh, Dalnaya Stepa took deductions for hiring disabled workers when the companies had no employees. They were just holding stocks. They didn't hire anybody. And they took deductions for investing in the region when all they did was, according to Panamarov, move money from one shell company to another shell companies. So uh, Magnitsky was the auditor. Uh, though Browder, to throw a red herring into the story, tells the world he was a lawyer. He hired in 2007. He was the accountant for a decade. This is the ID on his first testimony for the Russians, uh, line eight. He was an auditor. Uh, and uh, Panamarov told me that, that how they hired the so-called disabled for tax benefits. He said, if Browder was not so greedy and paid at least 200 a month to disabled workers in Kalmykia and had a real office, there would be no criminal case against him. The whole case is because he wanted to save money and not pay $400 for his two workers a month. They paid him about $20 for copies of their documents. So that's, that's the fraud there. In uh, Saturn Investments, 
In 2003, a civil judgment was entered against Saturn Investments for claiming tax deductions for disabled persons falsely represented to be analysts who were workers, a machine engineer, a gardener, somebody with no qualifications. They had nothing to do with Saturn. They were just used to get the tax relief. And Magnitsky also acknowledged in testimony he had the power of attorney as general director of Saturn Investments. So logically, if you're investigating and if you're detaining somebody, you want to talk to the people who are in charge and who are responsible. The other company, Dalnea Steppa, uh, the Kalmykia Court in 2003 established that disabled employees there were uh, part-time employees, actually not working there, but they were part-time because they actually had full-time jobs someplace else, and they couldn't be listed. They said uh, Byakiev, uh, Byakiev and Bukayev already had full-time jobs. Uh, Byakiev was a machine engineer and worked at the National Clearing Bank. Uh, uh, Bukayev had no qualification. He worked at uh, Energon Efter Essary, and uh, another uh, person, Badikov, was a worker. Uh, Browder paid off some, uh, a local uh, outside investigator who later recanted and explained that he gave him a clean audit, except a clean audit then doesn't really mean anything because it just means I looked at the paper, you're fine. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, then, so a court in December found that Dalnea Steppa had evaded about 20 million in taxes and the other almost the same, or more than that, it was a 24 million with the both of them. Now, this, uh, there's a deposition. Browder admitted the disabled, uh, the disabled worker scam in a deposition means it's under oath. It's the U.S. Uh, federal court in, in the Southern District of New York in 2015 because they asked, he was asked, who told you you could do this? That is, you could, you could put these people on as your employees when they really weren't working for you. And he said he was told it was okay by Arthur Anderson. Maybe that was one of their last dubious acts before they ceased operation because of their connection to the Enron fraud and Firestone Duncan and Ernst & Young, which is where Magnitsky had worked. But Panamarov told me other companies actually did hire workers. So if somebody said it's okay to do this, they didn't mean you could, you could cheat on it. You could, you'd have to hire them. Uh, after the Russian court decisions, uh, Browder transferred his assets out of the country via his Cypress shells, and he bankrupted the companies to, to erase a paper trail. He refers to that in his book. He describes how in one case he transferred the ownership to a Jakir Shaashua to bankrupt it, leaving the tax authorities as its only creditor. This was an ex-Mossad guy that Edmund Safra had introduced him to. He mentions him in the book and also mentioned him uh, in, in the deposition, except his, uh, uh, in, he had written in the book that he was uh, Ariel Busada, but he admitted that Busada was really Shaashua. Uh, Panamarov said that uh, Firestone Duncan also set up companies in 96 for Hermitage to buy Gazprom shares at a time there was a presidential decree banning foreigners from acquiring Gazprom shares. Uh, Browder's fraud was to use local cutouts instead of going, getting them in London as ADRs where the price was much higher. Uh, he explained to me, and remember, Panamarov was there at the time, in 96, we developed for Browder a strategy of how to buy Gazprom shares in the local market, uh, which was restricted for foreign investors. Local prices were much lower. To avoid this, uh, Firestone Duncan registered over 30 Russian companies, some of which were owned by myself or other partners of Firestone Duncan. All the companies owned and controlled each other. Hermitage sent its investor funds to these companies as loans. Then companies would give these loans to each other. As a result, when any of these companies would buy Gazprom shares, for everyone, it was a Russian-owned company with cash loaned from a Russian, another Russian company. Aponomar said the key tax investigation against Browder was about several billion uh, dollars of illegal profits from purchase and resale of Gazprom shares in between 97 and, and uh, 2006 when the decree was canceled. And in the decree was a provision that all deals made to avoid the decree were void. So Russia could confiscate the proceeds which Hermitage received over 10 years. 
he said, if HSBC and Bill were not afraid of this and really wanted to help Sergei Magnitsky, they could just pay the unpaid taxes and the criminal case against Sergei would be closed and he would be released from prison. Many of the Gazprom uh, buys were done via the Ziff Brothers investment funds. Uh, the Ziff Brothers are Americans, uh, it, which is a tax resident of the USA belonging to the billionaire brothers Dirk, Robert, and Daniel Ziff. It founded the company Speedwagon Investors 1 and 2, and which in turn registered on, the Cyp on Cyprus, the offshores, Joda Limited, Peninsula Heights, and Gigs Enterprise Limited. They own the Kamiki offshore, Kamea, and several others. Uh, Browder and his partner, uh, Ivan Cherkasov, headed all these shell companies, and the deals were con conducted through Kalmykia uh, LLCs with the shares acquired uh, on the St. Petersburg and Moscow exchanges as if they were being acquired by, uh, by Russians. Uh, in 06, the shares were consolidated in the Ziff's Kalmykia offshore Kamea. Kamea is important because that would be the company that investigators were, were in looking at when they did the search of the uh, Browder and Firestone Duncan offices. Uh, some of the shares uh, that uh, went into uh, Kalmykia uh, Kalmykia's Kamea were sold, some as dividends moved to Cyprus offshores, which sent them to the Speedwagon companies. The rest were acquired by the companies Dalnaya Stepa, Saturn Investments, and Ryland, also registered in Kalmykia by Browder. Uh, now, the Russians were investigating the various scams, and they called Magnitsky because he was the auditor responsible for the tax filings to give his first testimony in October of 06. That was two years before his arrest. He was asked about his role in Saturn and about Yakir Sha'ashua, the man who bankrupted it. He admitted he was a director of Saturn and he knew Sha'ashua. Russia said Gazprom, the Gazprom fraud cost the country about 30 million. And that's why Browder is fighting Russia's attempt to get Cyprus cooperation on investigating into his money flows because they went through the shell companies and the Russians want to see what happened. What, because why would uh, Browder be against Russians looking into uh, his companies, his shells in Cyprus? There's a reason. Uh, the Russians say the Ziffs may have violated U.S. law since Ziff Brothers Investments, a tax resident of the U.S., was not registered with the SEC as an investment company and shouldn't uh, participate legally in those transactions. Now, Magnitsky, in addition to his testimony in 06, gave testimonies in June and October 08. In June, he talked about the Hermitage Shell companies. Uh, he advised how Russian profits were transferred to the Cyprus companies. He talked about the uh, search, the June 07 search at Hermitage and Firestone Duncan offices involving seizure of don uh, documents of about 20 companies. He said in order to continue filing the tax and accounting statements that were required, the companies he had uh, ordered uh, replicas of the stamps and seals, which he stored in the Firestone Duncan office. That's important because Browder would later claim that the stamps and seals taken in the search were used to re-register the companies by official crooks. But Magnitsky had made duplicates. He says that in his testimony. He said he found out in October 07 about the lawsuits against some of the companies. Uh, these would be used in the scam that Andre would talk about. Uh, because uh, there would be lawsuits uh, uh, against these re-registered companies by fake companies, and the re-registered companies would say, oh, you're so right, we really do all this, we do all, all this money, and it just happens to be the exact amount that we paid in taxes, so we're asking the Treasury for a refund. He said he found out about the companies being stolen in October 07. Uh, and that... Uh, that is funny because in July 07, months before, HSBC, which was the trustee for Hermitage, uh, uh, had a document uh, in which they said they need $7 million more for their legal defense fund to defend a case that may involve the fact that their companies had been stolen. How did HSBC, and this, this document was attested to by uh, the controller of HSBC, uh, Albert Daba, who, testified, who gave a deposition in the, to the U.S. Uh, federal court, Southern District of New York, uh, that yes, this is true. So they know about it in July of, uh, 
of 07, which is one month after the search of the offices, Browder and Magnitsky, Browder also, but Browder and Magnitsky say, we found out about it in October of 07, months later. That's very fishy to me. Uh, now, so they put aside $7 million to deal with the theft of the companies, three, uh, three months before supposedly Browder and Magnitsky found out about it. Now, there's another fake story that um, uh, Mr. Firestone has uh, indi mentioned in some of the writings or, or videos that I have seen, so I'll bring that up. And he says, uh, Magnitsky, and Browder says, Magnitsky was arrested because of accusing some Russian officials of connection to the tax refund fraud. And that um, they say that in his last interrogation, October 08, a month before his arrest, he uh, said, uh, he accused two uh, investigating police of of uh, taking the documents and stealing the companies, which uh, and that that they were complicit in the 230 million uh, fraud. Uh, however, if you ah, sorry, that's, that's the next one. If but if if you look at the testimony, all of the testimony is on my website, in, in, translated into English, used in the federal in the court cases, and so they were tested to notarize. This is a true. Russian to English translation. If you look at that, he never, doesn't mention these officers, which Browder and Mr. Firestone say all the time. That's why he was arrested. He mentioned these officers. Their names are nowhere there in the document. Uh, and the, so the Magnitsky testimonies will, will prove a lot of what uh, Browder and Mr. Firestone uh, say are lies. It's at the commissarscoop.com. And, uh, and I will directly email them to anybody that requests that uh, afterwards. Uh, he was then detained, Magnitsky detained in November 08 as a suspect for his role in the Hermitage tax scams. He, and he actually made an, an um, accusation against the two investigators, Karpov and Kuznetsov. A year, almost a year later, he'd been in jail. Uh, it was October 09. He'd been in jail since November 08. But before that, in prison, he told Alec Luria, a journalist, that his employers, who had promised to get him out, were pressing him to make statements that had nothing to do with the charges against him, which were the tax charges. That, and the declaration was about the alleged role of Russian officials in the unrelated tax refund fraud. Luria gave a deposition, a sworn deposition, about that to the U.S. Federal Court, again, in the, in the Previzone case uh, uh, in the Southern District of New York. Now, what happens when you uh, go against uh, uh, Mr. Browder? Uh, I talked about Panamarov, who told me a lot about the tax uh, evasion fraud, the illicit Gazprom stock fraud. Well, the Russians called him to testify in uh, 2013. Now, now, he had had nothing to do with Magnitsky since about 98. So this is about 15 years later. And he left the firm. Uh, there was a bit of a fight. I talked to uh, the uh, mediation, uh, uh, per the person who mediated between uh, Panamarov and Mr. Firestone. He was the chairman of the Small Business Committee of the American Chamber of Commerce. And he said Panamarov accused Mr. Firestone of stealing money put aside to open a St. Petersburg office. But there was, so they ended their, uh, their connection in the company. Uh, so 15 years later, he's called to testify. And as a result, though, Magnitsky has been dead for four years, though so, uh, uh, Panamarov has had nothing to do with him for 15 years. He gets put on the European Parliament Magnitsky list because the Magnitsky list is really Browder's enemies list. And he... Uh, uh, Panamarov hired Lord Goldsmith of Debevoise and Plimpton in London to try to get off. But then the European Parliament president, uh, Martin Schulz, refused, explaining it was just, it was just a recommendation to the council. Uh, and so, therefore, he didn't have to deal with the actual facts in this case, and he wasn't going to do anything to give Panamarov a chance to get off uh, this list. Uh, there is no due process in the Magnitsky list. Basically, it's... A, it's a um, star chamber. The people never get to know what the uh, charges are. They never can see evidence. They can never challenge the evidence. It's a star chamber. So uh, this was the letter that um, 
that he sent back. And again, I will. It's I can send anybody the letter. It's on my website uh, that came from Martin Schultz. Uh, rule of law, due process are the ma major elements of what is lacking in the Magnitsky Law, which is pretty funny since they're supposedly dealing with human rights. Now, uh, what happens to international rule of law? Uh, th that was an issue for the individuals that get on the Magnitsky list. But what happens when a government, in this case for political reasons, can direct Interpol not to carry out its mission when so because they are protecting the, the target? Uh, I wrote to the Interpol press office in um, 2017. I said, for an article I'm writing, we'd like to get the evidence or background information that led Interpol to reject Russian requests to put out an arrest warrant for William Browder uh, on grounds. Interpol said the request was politically motivated. I'd like more details on the political motivation. I appreciate your response. So uh, this was the response. Basically, I'm sorry, we're not going to tell you anything because that's our policy. We'd, we we don't uh, comment on, on any of this. Uh, there's another ongoing case which ought to concern lawyers trying to trace illicit assets. Cyprus, where a lot of Browder's dirty documents are buried, um, uh, he has blocked Russia's attempts to get authorities' cooperation on examining, examining documents showing movement of Gazprom shares through the shell companies. Uh, and most shocking, a clique of European parliamentarians are threatening sanctions against Cyprus if the authorities cooperate. It's an attack on international cooperation to combat fraud, and it ought to be concerned of everybody who is looking for assets that, for political reasons, um, a government can be threatened by sanctions, threatened with sanctions, uh, in order to get them not to cooperate with uh, investigators. Uh, and I think I've, because of the earlier glitches, I'm not going to talk about the rest of, of this because I think that Andre uh, is in a good position uh, to, to continue. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'd always thought that uh, it was normal for people to uh, be reasonably skeptical uh, about extraordinary claims, about uh, grand moral claims, uh, which can be demonstrably uh, traced to, to, a, to a vested interest, really. But the Magnitsky case uh, taught me one thing, that, that, that all that skepticism is, is um, basically evaporates uh, when uh, the claims are made about that nightmarish... Uh, dystopia, that uh, Kafkaesque hell, uh, also known as Russia. So people basically don't need to prove much when they make claims about Russia. Some 100 minutes plus, which is the length of my film, I, I think is, is a minimum really to, um, to be able to um, kind of counter this facile um, uh, narrative uh, that the official Magnitsky case is, but um, and I've and I've written a book as well, but um, you know, f fifteen minutes or so is, is, is all I have, and I'm very grateful for that because because that's uh, rare uh, as well. Uh, any any time uh, I am invited to speak on this, and not that many times, but I'm outnumbered by a factor of ten or twenty people who all represent uh, basically Browder's. Uh, point of view, and uh, this time I, I do admit that Jameson is outnumbered by us. But uh, you know, for a change, Jameson, you know, might as well be. So, anyway, in his Magnitsky narrative, Browder omits many facts because I'm not. I'm, what I'm going to talk about is the Magnitsky case. Uh, Lucy was talking about a, a tax evasion case in Kalmykia and uh, other tax evasion matters, but the Magnitsky Act. Uh, as because it's, it's basically Browder's version of the events, it doesn't it doesn't include any of that, any of that tax evasion. The, the, the Magnitsky case is, um, um, and, and why it doesn't include because because he cannot claim when we talk about tax evasion a, a human rights moral ground, and Browder calls the Magnitsky case as the 
best human rights documented case, one of the best documented cases in the world. So the emphasis on, is on human rights. Uh, while I claim that the human, human rights here is a one bit big uh, red herring, basically, um, uh, Sergei Magnitsky did die, sadly, in, in a Russian jail. No evidence he was murder, uh, killed uh, or anyway beaten to death. Um, and, you know, to, to, for full disclosure, the, the Russians, which, for which have no Russian investigators, some Russian investigators, which have, haven't seen any evidence, so I say it very clearly, but some think that uh, Mr. Browder actually certainly had a motive to get rid of Magnitsky and, and may have actually done that. I, I repeat, I have no evidence for that. But, um, and... and, and Talking about human rights, I'm saying this as a, as a consistent critic of uh, uh, Russia's human rights record and, and its corruption too. Uh, but uh, while my criticism, ha criticism has been for years in my filmmaking, journalism, also in my activity in the Russian opposition, uh, parties and organizations, uh, the motivation of Mr. Browder is somewhat more intriguing. Um, while um, the Russian Air Force was pummeling Chechnya and um, I was uh, making films uh, uh, for also on the fate of uh, Chechen civilians then, uh, Mr. Browder was actually uh, making money and, as uh, Lucy pointed out, evading tax just in neighboring Kalmykia in the southern Russia. And... Uh, um, so he now claims that he is a, uh, one of the uh, most prominent uh, human rights uh, uh, activists in the world. And, and all the investigations and, and indeed uh, um, uh, verdicts, uh, court uh, indictment, um, convictions, um, are politically motivated. Um, he, he's, I'll, I'll quote, uh, any time you challenge the regime, they immediately put a stamp on your tax evasion. So let, let's have a look at uh, uh, how Mr. Browder was challenging the regime. Um, when he was allowed to make money, but when that particular case um, in Kalmykia already started, the Russians were already investigating for tax evasion in Kalmykia. So it's a very long one. I won't uh, force you to, 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 to watch. This is one of those power presentations because Mr. Brown is excellent as with, with power presentations, much better than I am. My power is my film, so this, this will, be, will not be perfect. But, but he basically defends the Russian government on every count of uh, a, a, a Russian policies there. And he says, and he defends Putin personally, saying that Putin is is uh, you know, the, uh, the best thing that happened to Russia, and it's certainly not corrupt. Uh, so there are a lot of articles. I'll just pick any I, you know, I could on the way here. So basically, uh, never mind the arguments about creeping coup by Putin's KGB colleagues, the war in Chechnya, I mentioned, the state takeover, television, etc., etc. Putin is a true reformer. Um, so... Um, but, but the point is that Browder was first investigator for financial misdeeds, and only then he appointed himself as a Putin's number one enemy. Uh, that's the timeline. That's the timeline, not the other way around. Uh, moreover, under the Magnitsky Act that was mentioned here in the U.S. and its equivalent in this country, uh, those who investigate Browder, basically, or investigated or continue to investigate, are put on the sanctions Magnitsky list. And a wonderful mechanism, whoever probes you for financial misdeeds or crimes, you, put, you just put them on a name and shame uh, sanctions list. You deny them visas to travel. They can't come here, for example, if, if David invites them. Uh, they, uh, their accounts are frozen, even though most of those cops actually don't have accounts. But it's psychological effects. It's very important. They are called uh, uh, thieves, murderers, you know. I know two of those, and I know they, they're not thieves and murderers, and they have, you know, kids growing up who m one day would ask, Daddy, are you a, a thief or murderer? Because, by the way, Russian press in that authoritarian Russia, uh, you know, authoritarian state Russia is supposed to be is actually uh, mostly 
all liberal press is completely pro-Western and pro-Broad, and it's totally free. Uh, it's secul it's, uh, circulates in a totally free manner. So, but but let's let's just let, let's recap, Mr. Browder. It's a complicated case, I know. But let's recap m m Mr. Browder's version. And I'm sorry, to, I have to say, Browder, 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 Browder. By the way, never accepted to, to debate with me. Uh, Jameson did, you know. Thank him. But uh, I'll have to call Browder, Browder, because it's, it's of course it's not just Browder, but uh, for uh, you know to be concise. So basically, the the, the story is is this in his version: an honest U.S. born. A uh, hedge fund manager goes to Russia, makes a killing, and eventually corrupt officials, uh, the brutal Russian cops, can't resist the, the temptation to fleece him. Okay, and um, so, um, uh, but, but the clever Mr. Browder uh, takes all his money out of the country by then, but the cops, you know, they are not fools either. They have a brilliant idea. Uh, Mr. Browder doesn't know what the idea is, but uh, he, he later uh, finds out. But, uh, you know, he first doesn't know. The police raids the offices, raids the offices, uh, very specifically, as Browder says, with the objective to uh, impound... Uh, seals were mentioned here, but actually uh, Browder men doesn't mention seals anymore much. The important thing is, is that... And that's the Magnitsky Act, by the way. Sorry, I've, uh, as I told you, I'm not very good with, 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 with this. Um, but so, but the, the police raids his offices with the objective of getting hold of the original company documents. Um, why? Because they are necessary to re-register those companies secretly, steal the companies, and then apply on the behalf of those companies uh, Browder companies, which, which uh, made profit and paid tax on it. So those uh, uh, companies would apply for a, a uh, tax refund and get it from the Russian state. And it's a handsome $230 million. So what's true and what, what's wrong with that story? Uh, Browder claims uh, that... The, the, uh, so, so, so um, no one denies, no one denies that the theft took place. Neither Mr. Browder nor the Russian government. So basically someone stole $230 million in this tax refund. Uh, uh, there is also no denial that the companies, those companies which applied, which first paid the tax and then applied for a, um, a refund, were, you know, as, as again, collectively speaking, you know, technically there were uh, the HSBC uh, Guernsey, uh, uh, management Guernsey was the trustee, but let's call them Browder's company. And he, never, he, he does call our company, my companies himself. So we're allowed to say Browder's companies, that he, was, he was in control of them. Uh, he doesn't deny that either. What he does say, that they were stolen from him by the time the money hit that refund uh, money hit the accounts. So, first, his companies, and they're called Parfinian, Macau, and Ryland. I'll call them the companies. So, f f first, they were stolen, and then the taxes were fraudulently refunded. Okay, what I say, I, I say the, f the, the, the f company theft is fiction. Um, and, and what does it mean? But I, I say the companies were not stolen. If, if I'm right, uh, the, the uh, Browder and the, the organization, let's call Browder organization, did not lose control of the companies. Um, the, he and his colleagues were involved in the preparation of their tax refund because it's, it's quite a job, you know. Even, you know of course, there, there must have been corrupt Russian officials involved, but the question is who initiated it. And, and, and who prepared it, because, because Magnitsky was one of those people who were in the know, you know, and it's a complicated operation to get a tax refund of, of this uh, proportion. So, so if the companies were not stolen, it means that, that Browder and company were involved in the preparation of the tax refund. Okay, so um, the, the, the next two essential uh, propositions have to be considered together because they're sort of strict cause-effect logic. Okay, that, that's false. That's, that's my claim. Okay, so 
uh, Browder claims police searched uh, the uh, Browders and Mr. Firestone's offices in order to impound those documents. So that was the objective. They, the original documents, mind you, very important, I mean paper originals, like Articles of Association and, and, and whatever, because, uh, again, Browder claims the, the original physical documents are absolutely necessary to get those companies re-registered, stolen. So that's why the police had to come and, and take them away. Okay, well, I claim that, it's, that, that it's, they're not necessary for a re-registration. I can promise you there's a, there's a relevant Russian law. Um, Uh, you know, the following physical persons may apply to register a company, director, owner, founder, bankruptcy receiver, and the following documents are required. A letter of application, a decision to enter the changes, the list of changes, and, and receipt of the fee paid. This is the law of the time. So, uh, but moreover, the, re -reg the registration is just a formality. It's another red herring. It's not a diversionary uh, sort of ploy by, by Browder. Re registration, it's, it's, it's not that different from, from anywhere else. Basically, the, the, to, to tra transfer ownership, you need, you need to have a, have a sort of um, sales and purchase agreement or something like this. You need to sell it to someone, and then someone needs to buy it. And then you re-register uh, those... Um, you go to this, you know, uh, re it's public, by the way, a registry, and you re-register the details, and the address, very important, not a banner address. We'll get to that. Um, so, and there was a sales and purchase agreement. There was a sale. Browder, for some reason, doesn't mention uh, the, 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 this, uh, this is just one of those companies. So the sales and purchase agreement was done on the basis of a power of attorney attention, given by a, the parent Cyprus company, uh, Lucy mentioned, Glendora and Cohn, uh, to, uh, uh, in, in Browder's control, that, that's not denied, to a certain Oktay Gasanov, a, a professional figurehead. So the, the, so the companies were sold to, to, uh, by this Gasanov with powers of attorney from basically Browder, his uh, system, to a certain Victor Markelov. Um, so, th though I must admit that uh, the uh, Browder organization did uh, denial, uh, did, oh, sorry, did uh, deny the validity of those powers of attorney, uh, but, in a, you know, they didn't like, like talking about it. You know, when my film mentioned it, uh, I heard some denials. So, well, you know, when my film was Public, it, it was uh, actually it was not in public, but Browder saw it. So, you know, my, the company was in Norway. Was uh, my producer thinks it, it was hacked or whatever? But, for, but Browder did see the film and sent it to his allies, and and he started saying, okay, reacting to my uh, version of these events, saying that okay, those powers of attorney were not valid, but but the the figurehead director uh, directors who signed them those did. In, in New York, in the, in the court case uh, Lucy mentioned, they did say it, it's their signatures. They did deny it on, on another occasion and, and showed utter ignorance, like most figurehead you know, nominee directors, utter ignorance about the, the business. They basically, they, 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 they front in Cyprus hundreds of those companies and basically are told what to do. So uh, whether or not those powers of attorney, and, and if they're valid, it means it, it's a proof that Browder, Browder's organization was, was preparing this whole uh, scam. Uh, um, so, but whether or not they're valid, Browder never mentions them. He, he doesn't mention the, 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 the sale. He doesn't mention the powers of attorney. He only, only mentions this re-registration, which I said is a formality. Why? Because... If you can con conceivably claim that you need some documents, you know, the police took away from the offices for the re-registration, and I, I'm saying uh, I can prove it's not, you, you don't need them, you don't need them, those paper articles of session. You can never claim you need any of that for a sale, for the sale, or for a, a sale, any sale of the companies. You don't need that. So the whole 
cause effect logic collapses. You know, the police raided the offices to get the documents, then secretly re registered them, and then stole the money. It's not valid, it doesn't work. So, but in reality, but both before and after this so called theft, uh, the, the companies were, you know, the, 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 there's always figurehead. Uh, we're talking about this kind of basically offshore business, yeah? There's always a, a figurehead director. There's never, uh, you know, the, once Browder actually was a director of those companies, and, and that's why the Russian police kind of uh, got him and indicted him in the case Lucy was talking about in Kalmyka because he did sign those documents. He was a director. He then probably got more clever, and he never signed uh, anything in this case. So, by the way, in that totalitarian, authoritarian in Russia, nobody actually indicted him. You know, why, why not? You know, if, if, you, if you know, there's a suspicion that he may have been involved in this preparation of this uh, operation, why not, in, why, why not in, in, indict him of this to boot? You know, he stole everything. They, they didn't because they don't, have, uh, they don't have a proof. So they don't actually, uh, and that red notice uh, which uh, the Interpol uh, has or, or, or had for him, it's actually about only the case that Russians were able to prove where the signatures there, not for this one, even though his story is wrong. So, um, uh, okay, oh, but by the way, the, sorry, the, 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 that was the contract, sorry, the sales and purchase agreement. These are the powers of attorney, sorry. These are the powers of attorney, which if, if, if they are, if they're, and these are the, the signatures of those Cyprus nominees. So if, if, if these are, are, are real, Browder, of course, was uh, aware of the whole thing, at least, if not preparing it. So, okay, but, th but this is just a, the, a, a, a list of some of those figurehead directors to, to, to show you that, you know, the, the figurehead directors after the re-registration there were Russians, before there were British or residents of Guernsey, but before the re-registration, also some Russians were uh, nominees like Ivan Cherkasov, and, and by the way, uh, Sergei Magnitsky himself, as Lucy correctly pointed out, for, for Saturn Investments. So uh, but there's a very important psychological element here. When, when Browder uh, and, and, and Franklin Jameson, in one of his early interviews, you know, he says... You know, the, the companies were kind of stolen by these basically, uh, you know, dirty Russians. One of them is a murderer. You know, these obscure, uh, horrible individuals. So the, the companies were stolen by the dirty Russians. Stolen from whom? Mr. Browder, HSBC. You know, obviously, obviously, if the new directors are some dubious Russians... It must, have, must be theft. But as we know, uh, those companies are always, uh, uh, you know, um, formally, formally owned or, 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 or the, 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 the directors are the nominees, whether they're Russians, British, uh, you know, uh, whoever. So th this is pure psychology. And... And uh, a, a Western fund manager would, would, of course, not go out himself, you know, in the Moscow streets to, uh, to, to, to look for some shady uh, if, let's say, if A, we're not, not even mentioning Brown, and X, Y, Z, but somebody from the West. He doesn't go out to look for these uh, uh, sort of shady characters to, to um, become his nominee directors. Because, by the way, it's a prerequisite. If, if indeed it was the Western fund manager who uh, pulled off this, this $230 million tax refund scam, uh, you, you must transfer the ownership to somebody. It's a prerequisite. There's nothing extraordinary about it because otherwise you get caught straight away because it's your, it's your nominees who, who are traceable, who are directly traceable to you. So it's, 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 a, it's a must to have the sale or registration, the so-called theft. And of course he doesn't go out himself. There's a, there's a, there's a service, the kind of service for these frauds. Uh, you know, uh, you, you basically delegate it to somebody, to, to, to a specialist who will deliver, or, by the way, might, might fail in this case. I don't know. My intuition is something went wrong. 
Maybe, maybe Brother didn't get all that money. I don't know. But what I know is that his story is wrong. So he must know much more than he's telling us. But, uh, but so, uh, all right. So the red registration re refund was, uh, yeah, basically, that's, that, that's, that's the big, big, big uh, statement. Um, um, so, the, the question is, how, okay, whoever did it, how was it actually done? How is it on earth possible to get a refund of almost a, a quarter of a billion dollars? It's interesting, isn't it? Okay, what happened is this. Uh, the, there were lawsuits. That's false. And that's the timeline. Before uh, this uh, theft, both re-registration or the sale, I'm not going to argue anymore. I, yeah, I, I say the sale is important. They say registration is important. But, but never mind. How, how did the theft happen? Before the uh, sales of the companies, which was uh, uh, on the 31st of July, very strange lawsuits, uh, claims were filed against Browder's companies, okay, uh, in St. Petersburg. So all in all, I think about eight. Um, th the aim was to artificially wipe out the profit the companies made and paid it tax on, that big tax. So that you can go back to the taxman and say, okay, we, we, we have no profit. Something happened, you know, we, we, we owe money, so there's no profit, zero profit, and we pay so much money, give it back to us. That's legal, in theory. The question is, who did it? So, uh, normally, the default position, by the way, in this, this situation with what I already said, would be for Browder, uh, you know, he, he basically was and remained in control of those companies, so it's up to him to prove they were stolen. But no, because of also for political reasons, it's, it's me who have to prove some of this, you know, not, not the normal logical default position. So, I, so uh, and that's why the import, the, these lawsuits are very important. If Browder, if Browder had not known about the preparations for this refund fraud, the, the lawsuits in particular, the question is when and how did you find out? So uh, if, if, if I sue someone here, I sue someone, in Russia, I think everywhere. I need to notify. I need to notify uh, the defendant. In Russia, it's it's both the the uh, the plaintiff and the court. They send letters, registered letters. The letters are signed, returned, and only then a lawsuit goes ahead. In theory, so uh, the, the and well, there were a lot of lawsuits. So so the, the, the those letters were sent to 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 Mr. Browder to the correct address was before the re-registration. They were signed, they returned, the, the lawsuits did go ahead, so Browder has to explain to us what happened. Okay, I'm kind of now defending Mr. Browder and that group. The, the, the crooks, the Russian, even though, uh, as I said, it was before the theft for some reason. But, okay, the, 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 the bad Russian guys uh, sent those uh, letters, those notifications, to wrong address, which, are the, which they control, so that Browder, you know, the, this, this lot doesn't see them. Okay, they signed, the criminals, they signed, returned to the court, and the, and the lawsuits went ahead, so that, you know, the, 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 then, then, then the tax refund went, 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 went ahead, you know, the, the profit was wiped, okay, the bad, bad Russian guys got the money. But my, my question is, if... Because according to Browder, in some things, you know, those, those cops were clever, you know, to, 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 to invent this, you know, it's, you have to be quite clever. So why didn't they first steal the companies, re-register the companies, and then initiated those lawsuits? Because, uh, uh, because uh, you know, what, 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 what happened is that basically you are, you are, uh, you, there's, there's such a risk. You are suing. You are suing the, this uh, the, the broad organization, which is not the, the, the most weak and naive. You're suing the r real companies, you know, 
for, for a billion of dollars, it was for, in, in, uh, in all, to, to, to claim 130 million, you, you have to wipe out a billion dollars of profit. So you sue them for a billion of dollars, and, and they exist, they have real addresses, the, the, the addresses you, uh, you have to, because you have to bribe so many officials not to send them to the correct address. Why not do it the other way around? Uh, one thing, uh, apropos, apropos these lawsuits, this is another fact no one denies, neither Mr. Browder nor the Russian government. They were, they were a fake. They were basically, uh, the, the litigation was controlled by the same people, yeah? They, they were to, to, create this, to, to, to create this minus billion dollars. So, but the, so the question is who did it. But, uh, but so, so this, is, this doesn't make sense. First, first start the lawsuits and then re-register because you, it's very risky. But it gets worse. Magnitsky, out of all people, states on the record that he did receive those notifications because they had to explain. They had to say, you know, when, when did you, if you, I, did, I don't know, I did, it wasn't me. When did you find out? So he does say, I did receive them on the 16th of October. And, and, and Browder confirms with a very strange statement that he got a phone call. But, but anyway, yeah, okay. So, so, the, uh, so Magnitsky does say he received them, which was after the registration. And he said, and in received him, received them at the correct address, or, or even though the companies were already publicly re-registered with a new address. And the, this correct address, I'm sure Jam Jameson remembers this uh, Staropiminsky Pirulok in, in, in Moscow. How come? How didn't they, you know, they, it was already legal if they, they, they'd stolen it to send it to a new address where, where Magnitsky, Browder, uh, Jameson would, would, would never find them and the, and the whole thing would go ahead. So it makes absolutely no sense. The only logical explanation is that Browder organization got all the letters as they normally would, the lawsuit would go, went ahead as they normally would, and, you know, we have to ask them, how much they knew about the, the, the scam. But even if one accepts they only, that, that, that they only found out about so late, they didn't do anything for, for still for you know, six or seven or weeks to come. That if, if somebody sues you, you know, steals your companies, sues you for a billion dollars, don't you call the police? Or, or do, and and, and, you, and you, they can't claim, oh, this is, this, this is, a, this is a horrible authoritarian state, we're so afraid to call the police. Because they did. They did later. They did complain. But, 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 you know, and they did go to court. Magnitsky said they were, that they were going to send a lawyer. The, the moment they found out on the 16th, they said that they're going to send a lawyer immediately because the next hearing was on the 20th. I, I even remember, not, you know, from documents, that it was Monday, next Monday, 22nd of October. The lawyer, sh we, we, we'll send a lawyer to defend our interests. The lawyer didn't show up. They didn't do anything. The lawyer only showed up in the new year after the money was stolen. Uh, okay, so um, unfortunately, no. Uh, yes, there, there, there's, there's lots of inconsistencies like this, and and I can just um, say that you know, uh, as I said, my, the emotional, human rights, political, moral aspects are extremely important here, and that's what you know. Basically, any 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 anything you say about Russia is basically doesn't need any proof. Um, uh, Broad is now saying. Uh, Magnitsky, he compares him to Nelson Mandela, to a f famous Russian uh, dissident, uh, Soviet dissident Andrei Sakharov. He once said once or, or more, at least I heard in the German uh, TV, he basically called Magnitsky God. This is our new next religion, more or less. I, I, you know, I have it on the record. And, 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 you know, I'm not a specialist in theology. Uh, I don't know about that. But, uh, but he, he, Magnitsky was clearly not what Browder uh, tells he was. And, 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 and you know, and we, we all want to believe in heroes. We all want, you know, with all the, uh, yes, that's the same, yeah, the, you know, the, and basically the all, all um, cynicism and selfishness around us and in us makes us want to believe there's this hero out there. And that's why we believe Browder's story. But, but, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, please, please watch my film. Please watch my film before Browder manages to take it down because he didn't manage to take it down from the Vimeo. The film is still online 
and you can pick up those uh, cards over there to find it. Thank you. Can I do this with the, um, the mic I've got here and opposed to this one? Am I, am I on the mic now? Can people hear me? Okay, good. No or yes? Okay. Yes, yes. No. All right, you've got my slides. Okay, so um, when I was invited here, David asked me to ask, um, answer a few questions. He asked all of us to answer these questions, and they're listed there except for the, the two bottom ones. Those I, I kind of added. Um, and David mentioned maybe this is all kooky. Actually, this is not kooky. This is spooky, and I mean spooky by the way, uh, the meaning covert. So let me take you through what happened, and I really do want you to watch Andre's movie, and I really want you to read the Commissar Scoop when we're done. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I didn't know we had one. Great. Oops. Okay, so first of all, the Magnitsky affair was, was not triggered by non-payment of taxes. The Magnitsky affair was triggered because of the huge amount of taxes that Hermitage paid, okay? And this made Hermitage particularly uh, irresistible to people who steal taxes from the government. We paid $407 million in 2006, and that's larger than all of these well-known Russian companies. Another reason the Hermitage companies were, ta were targeted is because Bill Browder actually didn't screw minority investors. He protected minority investors, and he picked a lot of bad fights. And he picked a fight, one of these fights, with Sergut Gas, which was uh, diluting its minority shareholders, which included Hermitage. And that was particularly bold because Putin and Timchenko were ro uh, rumored to hold large shares. So what happened when we, uh, when we started trying to stop this share dilution? Well, the first thing that happened, okay, was that the Ministry of Internal Affairs launched investigations on various Hermitage companies, including two investigations in Kalmykia, to challenge the tax status. Did we qualify for the benefits that we were using? Okay, and the second thing that happened is when Bill didn't take the hint and he continued suing to put aside the, the share dilution, he gets declared persona non grata on grounds of national security five days before our case for Sigurd Nip is about to be heard in the Constitutional Court. So what happens to these investigations? Well, these investigations actually continued, uh, looking in to see whether we qualified for uh, whatever benefits in Kalmykia, and they continued on until 2006. Lots of people were questioned, Sergei was questioned, lots of people, and they were finally closed for lack of a crime. In other words, the investigation investigated and came to a conclusion, and that was that, or so we thought. Anyway, what happens in Russia when you pay $407 million <laughs> worth of tax? All right, well, what happens is about six months after that tax year ended, after paying all that money, the Moscow Interior Ministry raids my office and Hermitage's office under a new case against Kamea. It only paid $135 million while it was under Hermitage's management, okay? And the police had forensic accountants. You've never seen anything like this. They're pulling off the, the accounting records at every company in our office, going through to find companies that have paid a lot of tax. Now, normally, you would think that they would be looking for companies that weren't paying tax. And what they did was really interesting, because they did take these uh, corporate seals and original charters and certificates uh, for lot and, and financial accounting records, by the way, for lots of companies, not just Kamea. They had a search warrant that said they can only take stuff for Kamea, but they were interested in just any kind company that paid tax. And when Andre says that you can register a company without these uh, documents, no, it didn't happen. I registered like lots and lots. You can make official copies, but let me tell you something. You show up to the registration office without the charter, okay, or without an, uh, an original certified copy or something that's been issued by the Moscow Registration th Chamber, they send you home, okay? So if you're going to steal some companies, you better get some documents, all right? All these documents are in the, the safekeeping of Pavel Karpov, and we're saying, hey, give us the documents back, or certainly give us back the documents for the three companies, because they don't have anything to do with your search warrant. So what happened next? Andre mentioned these lawsuits. So we learn that three of our companies were sued for $973 million and that a lawyer showed up in court and fully accepted all the claims. This, this lawyer defending our companies basically threw the case, intentionally lost, and three companies have $973 million worth of judgments in a, in, in a, uh, in, in a legal case. Now, important you see who, he, who that lawyer is. His name is Andre Pavlov, and he's rather important here. Okay, so how can you actually get a case litigated without lawyers, right? I mean, we were the lawyers, we should have been there. Well, what happened is, is that while the police had those materials, the owner of the Hermitage Fund was changed. And uh, the new owner became this company, uh, Pluton in Tartar Tartarstan, which was owned by a convicted killer now. 
And he appointed himself and several of his criminal cronies as, Nova, as new directors, and they're the people who hired this Pavel Karpov, I'm sorry, uh, Andrei uh, Pavlov, who showed up in court and threw the case. So what actually happens when we find out about this, okay? Well, we say, help! We put together this uh, two filings in December of 2007. You can see them here. You can see the dates. I've got arrows pointing to the dates because you can see the dates. They can't. And when you watch Andre's movie, you're going to see he can't see the date, but I'm going to tell you why also. So what do these say? Uh, one of them is that little English translation there. We basically say, help. Our companies are under criminal control. Here are the criminal directors. Here are their criminal records. Lawyer Pavlov showed up in court and threw the cases and all these fake debts were done. Here are the names of the police officers who searched our office. Uh, so basically, we exposed the theft of the companies and the fake debts in early December. Now, what happens, uh, what happens next? Unbeknownst to us, Three, three weeks later, right, these fake debts are used to obtain a refund of all the taxes that these companies had paid while they were under hermitage management. Now, what they did is they just say, look, you declared a $973 million profit before, paid $230 million. We've got these debts now. Kind of equals out at zero. Give us the money back. The refund was made in one day, okay, on Christmas Eve. Now, uh, you'll notice we had filed our complaints about the theft it turns out, well, it was in progress. We didn't know that. Uh, if you're going to go steal money, you generally don't tell the police that you're, <laughs> you're going to go steal money. Now, one thing I want to uh, call attention to here right, is that the rate of tax that Hermitage paid was 24%, which was the highest rate at the time. There were no special tax uh, discounts given. It didn't use any benefits when it cashed out. And there's a reason for that, um, because all of the, any tax benefits that were um, in effect in Kalmykia were canceled by Putin long before we actually cashed out. You can check the figures, just take 230 million, divide by 973, you get 24%. You can't really play with that. Now, um, what happened when we filed our complaint saying, help, help, you know, our, our companies have been stolen, we think that the police are involved? Well, what happened is an investigation was opened in January, and Officer Karpov and others were questioned, and they didn't really like that. So on the 27th of February, 2008, our Officer Karpov, along with two subordinates of Kuznetsov, the guy who searched my office, and an FSB officer fly to Kalmykia, and they reopened the two tax investigations that had found no crime and that we qualified for everything. You can actually see the thing here. Ruling on reversing the ruling uh, of dismissal of the case and initiation of a criminal case. But they didn't just reopen the case. Without any investigation, on the same day, they changed the finding from lack of a crime to crime and indicted Bill and moved the, co uh, moved the case to the control uh, of themselves. So now the case, uh, there, there's now a criminal case against uh, Bill. Now, it's very important you watch Andre's movie because Andre's movie says we didn't report the crime first and he says the whistleblower is somebody named Rima Starova. So what, who is Rima Starova and who, who does he say is the whistleblower in this case? Okay, well, what happened was after the refund, the criminals needed to get rid of the stolen companies. So they sold them to a BVI company called Boily Systems, owned by Mr. Sour Cream. I'm not making this up. A vocational skills instructor from, uh, skills instructor from Nova Cherkask who made his neighbor Mrs. Old Woman, not making that name up either. That's how their names translate, who happens to be an old woman. She's a 70-year-old pensionnaire. Okay, so all of a sudden, Andre and Lucy say that this... Uh, Rima Starova is the first one to report the crime. But you'll notice she reports it on the 9th of April, four months after us. So why don't they actually see our filings? That's an interesting question. And second, why do they present Starova as if she's someone legitimate? They never say who she is, and she's very important. I mean, it's obvious that sour cream and old women are just fronts, right? How could they possibly be the legitimate owners and managers of companies that once had billions of dollars? So what did Starova file and why? This is really interesting. The criminals needed, not only needed to get rid of the companies, they needed to get rid of the case against them. So Starova reports the fake debts. She doesn't name any names. She doesn't, she doesn't mention the refund. And she claimed to be the victim. She said, I bought some companies, and they've got fake debts against them for $930 million, right? And, and, so she, and she filed the complaints with officers under criminal control. So what do they do? The officers use this as an excuse to, uh, to launch a parallel investigation of themselves and the theft, and they close legitimate investigation, burying our complaint of uh, 3rd and 10th of December. So let's go forward. Just at the same time this old lady is filing her complaint, Sergey actually discovers the fraudulent refund, and we file another 200 and something pages, January 23rd, here's our complaint, saying, by the way, now we understand why the companies were stolen and the fake debts were there. They robbed $230 million from your money. What do you think the Russian government does? Nothing, okay? So what gets Sergei named the tax cheat? What gets him arrested and killed? Well, what happens is in about October of uh, 2009, 
Sergey discovered that there was another identical tax refund fraud, $107 million stolen one year before uh, from Rengas companies that were under the control of another hedge fund. And what was really interesting was fake documents were used word for word. The only thing that was changed was the company. The proceedings had been brought in the same court. And the funny thing is the same defense lawyer showed up and threw that case also and said, hey, we owe all this money, right? And um, as soon as they got the judgments, they moved those companies to the same tax officers that one year later would refund our money. Um, and um, all the money was refunded to the same bank that one year later our money would go to. So what can you actually tell about this? What you can tell is there's a group of serial crimes, cookie cutter, huge tax runs, uh, refunds being uh, done. It's clear that Pavlov is involved in both. It's clear that the tax inspectors are involved in both. both. And it's clear that the bank is involved in both. So what happens after Sergei uh, reports this? Well, let me tell you what happens, OK? Hold on, hold on. So what happens after, uh, after, after this is reported, OK? What happens is, remember that Kelmick case, the one that had been investigated and closed, and then when we file a complaint, the officers we complain about fly up to Kalmykia and reopen it in one day, and all of a sudden uh, declare Bill uh, uh, indicted? Well, that had been languishing for nine months. Absolutely nothing had been done on that case because Bill was in London. He was, you know, persona non grata, right? So that wasn't really f effective in shutting him up. So what the officers do is they pull the case off, they brush off the dust, and they say, Sergei is a suspect in committing tax fraud with Bill and Kalmykia. And then an arrest team under Kuznetsov, the guy who led the searches on my office and the guy who we fig fingered and the guy who Sergei testified, came to Sergei's house and arrested him in front of his wife, wife and child. So um, that's how Sergei got arrested. I'd like to tell you a bit about uh, Sergei's treatment in prison. I'd also like to tell you about his last day. Okay, so Sergei went into prison healthy. Um, and he was held for almost a year. He was held in filthy cells. They were either freezing cold or, 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 or boiling hot, unclean water, and he was denied all medical care. So take any one of you, or, or me for that matter, and stick me in a cell where it's dirty. Um, what? The what? I can't hear. Oh, I'm gonna. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay, hold on. Where's the proof that he was beaten? For example? I'm. Go I'm going through it now. Okay, because these are these are in here. I'm about to. If you would please let me speak. Do we have it? Well, we're about to. Do we have it? Do we have a Q and A at the end? Thank you. So he did ask for proof, and that's a very fair. Um, that's a very fair question. So what you'll see here. Okay, and first of all, by the way. Um, right before, when he got really sick and right before he needed an operation, they moved him out of a prison that had medical facilities. He was scheduled for the operation, and they put him in Butyrka, a, uh, basically a, a, a prison that was built under czarist times, and it's basically a hellhole. So he goes into Butyrka, and he's kept there, denied the operation until 16th of, of November, uh, when, here's your proof, right? So we've got our little uh, document here from the prison that says he needs emergency hospitalization and must be moved. So he is moved on the 16th of November. And then you'll see more, more documents from the prison, right? So right here, we've got the report to use handcuffs on Magnitsky, and we've got the report to use rubber batons and beat him, OK? Now, going on for some more proof, OK? We also find prison documents that say, well, when we got in, the doctors weren't allowed in while he was suffering. The doctors were allowed in when there was a dead body lying on the floor. And we also have the, the prison and police file pictures of what happened here. See, this is what happens when you're chained to a bed, right? And eight officers are beating the hell out of you, and you're trying to pull yourself, and you're lacerating your things. This is all from police files, but you don't have to believe me, because two independent commissions in Moscow were called. Moscow oversight, uh, Prison Oversight uh, com uh, Committee finds that he was systematically uh, denied medical care, finds that he was subjected to physical and psychological pressure, finds that his right to life was violated. Let me explain what right to life means. It means when I put you in a cage and you have to depend on me for heat, food, water, and medical care, and I take it away from you, you die. That's what was violated. Okay, then President's Human Rights Council, and by the way, this is President Medvedev, not President Obama, okay? Uh, what do they find? They find that his arrest and detention was in breach of the European Human Rights Commission, that Magnitsky was beaten, which led to his death, and they find that he was prosecuted in contravention of law, in, in contravention of law by the same people. Now, if you guys think that we can influence the findings of people who work for Medvedev in Moscow while we're public enemy number one, I got news for you, we can't. Okay? So, so let me go on to the trial, because Sergei was tried after his death, like the first person in 800 years to be tried after his death. Lucy writes in the, com in the Commissar Scoop 
Though Browder claims Magnitsky was convicted, a Russian document shows the case against him was closed before he died. So I clicked on her closed link and I threw this up on the wall, right? So this says, in July of 2013, Moscow's Tersky District Court found Magnitsky guilty of tax evasion. Convicted, okay? And closed the case during his death. It's true he wasn't sentenced because they had killed him already, so there wasn't really much more they could do to the man, right? Browder sentenced, now, was sentenced. Now, convicted. let's go down, okay? Let's talk about how Sergei was tried after his death and why. Because the trial was even less legitimate than the case. Sergei was dead. Dead men can't defend themselves. That's actually why we don't try them in the West, OK? So Sergei and Bill were defended by lawyers provided by the state. We did not in any way participate in this trial at all. The entire case was built on, based on Kuznetsov's and Karpov's investigations of the case, the same case that they'd reopened and changed the finding of. So we had a Russian show trial. The uh, outcome was never going to be in doubt. This is how people who had paid $407 million in tax just one year earlier were convicted under a sham case of avoiding $8 million uh, in tax over a period of, that ended eight years prior. Okay? So why do this crazy farce? What did the, what did the Russian government fear so bad? Why did they need this ba decision so badly? And what are they so afraid of? Well, the narrative effects in Russia is bad, right? I mean, the idea that... This, that, that the state is, collecting, is, is, is protecting people who killed a whistleblower so they can rob their own treasury isn't really a good one. And also the narrative's effect in Russia. We're pushing sanctions, so they needed to say we're not crooks, they are, and that's why they needed this. One more, they're very afraid of our findings, which I'll show you in a second. So what did we find? What we found was this amazing tidal wave of, stank, of state sanctioned uh, money laundering. We found our money, not surprisingly, Right, going 11.7 million went to the tax inspectors who approved the refund. Also the same people who had approved the previous refund. One trail goes to a company owned by lawyer Pavlov and the man who owned the bank, also not surprising. But then we started getting surprised. One, one money trial went to the uh, deputy mayor of Moscow. 800,000 of the crime went to a, an account held by Putin's good friend, a cellist. Now that may not be so shocking, but what's shocking is another $2 billion went through the account of Putin's friends, the cellists, came out in the Panama Papers. So I guess that cellist or somebody else has his fingers in a whole bunch of deals, okay? And now, if we go here, this is the, more, the most interesting one at all, of all. We took one of the money trails because it went to, a, uh, it, it went to, some Mos it went to the family of Moscow government officials, and uh, they used their money to buy property in New York City. Um, and that would qualify for money laundering if our, if our um, findings were correct. So we turned this entire thing over to the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, which did open a civil forfeiture case, and I'm going to show you where this led in a minute. But um, first I want to talk about some things that Lucy and Andre don't like to talk about. So um, although the Russian government has brought case after case against us, and although the Russian government has tried to red notice an expedite bill, I think, seven times now, there's one thing the Russian government has never done. It's never asked a foreign government or bank to find its stolen money. Curious, huh? Not really, because all the money goes to people we accuse or friends and relatives of Russian officials. The other thing that's curious is that the refund crimes continued after Sergei's death. Another $370 million in refunds are approved by the same tax inspectors, and they go into a new bank at the same address owned by the same people. Okay, now... Was this investigated independently? Yes. I already showed you what happened in Russia, but I can also show you that we've, for, we've frozen $43 million in various countries. And, and trust me, like when I, you know, if we write to a bank or, or a law enforcement agency, they don't just like freeze it immediately. If they did, all of you would be my clients, okay? And if you look here on the evidence of conducting an investigation in the Council of Europe, they actually specifically uh, replied to Andre, who claimed that, oh, you know, there's no independent stuff here. They said they, they refute that. They had two visits to Moscow. They met with senior representatives of the Russian authorities with leading human rights figures. They looked at the documents. Okay, in addition to that, who else checks our facts, all right? Um, as you all know, uh, we pushed really hard for the Magnitsky sanctions in the United States, and during that process, <laughs> everything's checked by the Department of State, the Treasury, the CIA, Department of Justice, National Security. So these are the kinds of people who, who check us, right? So in December 2012, the U.S. passed the Magnitsky sanctions. They sanctioned the people involved in the crime that Sergei exposed and the people who commit human rights violations in Russia. The Russian government saw this as a threat, and they fought them bitterly by calling Sergei a crook. They also retaliated by banning Americans from adopting Russian orphans. They couldn't throw us out of their banks because we weren't there in the first place, okay? But more threatening was the Global Magnitsky Act, which by 2015 was moving through Congress, and it would make corruption's ground for being sanctioned. And I don't know why, but the Russian government wasn't comfortable with that, okay? So um, 
That case that, was, that I mentioned to you that the U.S. attorneys took on, uh, it was called Prevazone. That was the company that they held on the other side. And uh, very interesting, while we were like fighting that, the general prosecutor of Russia gives a statement. He says, if Prevazone is found guilty, the decision will legally validate Browder's version of the story. From the embezzlement of the Russian treasury funds to the false arrest of Sergei Magnitsky, it would support the necessity of passing the law named after him. The judgment would have precedental val val uh, value in many countries. How right you are. So here's what happened, right? The U.S. case is, is going through. And one of the things the U.S. case, uh, the, now the U.S. government is not us, OK? They have the power to subpoena banks. They have the power to go to foreign governments and ask them for information. So they're really, they, they don't take, and they don't take cases they think they're going to lose. So one of their conclusions, and again, the case didn't finish. It settled, OK? But one of their conclusions that they're willing to fight for was that uh, Hermitage is a victim, not a perpetrator of the Russian Treasury Fund. And they looked at all this Gassanov stuff, and they deemed them to be forgeries. So. Russian government now has to go into overdrive, pushing this false narrative, right, that, that, that we're all crooks. So let me take you through what happens here. In February 18th, 2016, Veselnitskaya, the lead lawyer for Pre Pre uh, Prevazone, sets up a human rights uh, fund, an NGO in Washington, D.C., funded by the man behind Prevazone, stated purpose to overturn the ban on Americans adopting Russian orphans. Sounds nice, huh? May 19th, there's a press release issued by the general prosecutor of Russia. It accuses Ziff brothers, William Browder, and myself, and others of violating the Gazprom decree. Um, I got some news for you. We didn't violate it, but there were no penalties for violating it. But we really were careful not to, because we have investors who would have sued us if we had. Okay? Then, on June 3rd, Rob Goldstone wrote an email to Donald Trump Jr. saying that the crown prosecutor of Russia wants to provide the Trump campaign with official documents that will incriminate Hillary and her dealings with Russia and will be very useful to your dad. And he follows up saying that the person he'd be meeting will be the Russian government's attorney. And who shows up at Trump Tower but this Veselnitsky, the lead lawyer you know, for, for Prevazone? And what is the subject of the meeting? Bill and Magnitsky are cooks. The, U, the crooks, the U.S. has been tricked. If, you, if your dad becomes president and he kills the Magnitsky sanctions, Americans can start adopting Russian kids again, and relations will improve dramatically. And how would you like a bit of dirt on Hillary? But she didn't actually stop at Trump Tower. Then she organized and paid for, out of her fund, a screening of Andre's film. Okay? This is before anybody knows her name. She has not been exposed yet for what she is. So now things start to fall apart. I'm going to show you how. We file a complaint with the DOJ saying, hey, Veselnitska and her whole N NGO are a fraud. They're a front. They're a foreign lobbying organization that hasn't registered and declared. Because foreigners have to say, hey, we're lobbying on behalf of foreigners, and here's what we're doing. And that's not what they were doing. And then on October 17th, the US Court of Appeals Second Circus disqualified the entire US Prevazon defense team. And then the Global Magnitsky Act does become law. And then the Trump Tower meeting gets disclosed, but the story hasn't broken yet. So faced with, like, with, with losing the Prevazon case, but not just losing the case, but having the entire Russian government narrative repudiated in U.S. federal court, Veselnitskaya, lead counsel, also known as the Russian government lawyer working for the Crown Prosecutor of Russia, has the defense team negotiate a $5.9 million settlement without an admission of guilt, which removed the case's threat to the alternate narrative. So there is no finding in a U.S. court of guilt. Okay? And then all hell breaks loose because the New York Times does actually uh, published the story of what happened. And Congress was not amused, even though they're totally pro-Trump, they passed more sanctions as a reaction to this. Now I'd like to just get to something curious. Shortly after the whole Trump Tower thing blew up, enter Lucy Commissar, who I'd never heard of, heard of in my life before. And I want to show you her email, because it's really curious. So September 6, 2017, I'm a journalist writing an article which deals in part with tax evasion and tax refund fraud against the Russian Treasury involving some hermitage uh, companies. Konstantin Ponomarev, who founded Firestone Duncan with you, which isn't true, he founded like Firestone Duncan Mark III, told me how the firm with Sergei Magnitsky uh, uh, arranged tax evasion schemes for, her, for hermitage. Okay? And then she goes on to say, Andrei Pavlov told me he worked on a fake lawsuit claiming liabilities for Hermitage. And then let's skip down to the bottom here. Uh, he said, Pavlo said the refund application would require detailed information from the company's books, which he said pointed to inside involvement. He said, I think Firestone Duncan was the thing. So I get this. Now, I have to tell you, I didn't talk to her. But I'm going to tell you why I didn't talk to her. Thank you for mentioning Constantine so many times. So I was partners with Constantine for a while. I. Uh, he basically tried to steal half a million dollars from me. I had him removed from the office by physical force. We, we fought for many, many years. And eventually, he sued for peace. But Constantine went on to bigger and better things. Constantine, first of all, I should say her article ran, OK? 
on October 20th, before I say any more. So October 20th, 2017, she writes this article. You should go online. You should see it because basically her star witnesses are Constantine and Pavlov. Constantine went on to bigger and better things. He ripped off IKEA for 25 billion ruble, uh, rubles. That's $1 billion. Constantine Ponomarov made the Russian Forbes list at $1 billion, ripping off $1 billion. But what's more interesting is you can see the stories about him being arrested. He was arrested in June okay, of 2017. So when Lucy wrote me on September 6th of 2017 telling me how Konstantin Ponomarov told him we were tax cheats, he'd already been sitting in a Russian prison for three months, four months from when her story ran. What kind of a journalist does the Russian government favor so much that it arranges you to carry on a dialogue with a prisoner when Sergei couldn't even make a phone call? And by the way, what kind of a journalist publishes an article and comes here and says what you said and fails to mention that your current source is, is, is sitting in a prison right now, right now for bribing witnesses, fabrication Just of like evidence. Magnitsky. No, 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 excuse me. Just you like you Magnitsky. don't disclose, okay? You, you Next, don't okay? And her second star witness, Andrei Pavlov, okay? As I said, involved in two refund fraud cases, one that didn't involve any Hermitage companies, owned a Cypriot company that he received proceeds from the crime, and Pavlov was busted in Kazakhstan in May of this year for bribing officials of the Republic of, of Kazakhstan. These are their star witnesses, and what I will tell you about these people is how credible are these people. Okay, obviously they're not acting as investigative journalists because their craft is concealing, not revealing, all right? Um, they don't investigate anything. Everything you've heard here is the Russian government case. They promote a narrative that they have huge backing from the Russian state. Five Russian state TV channels and lawyer Pavlov show up in Brussels when Andre tries to show his movie there. And a covert Russian agent, Veselnitskaya, who offered the Trump campaign dirt on Hillary Clinton in exchange for killing the sanctions, happens to be the person paying for our screenings of, screenings of Andre's movie. And Lucy's given access to, to interview somebody in prison uh, and her internet site is filled with articles designed to promote this Russian government narrative and question whether sanctions are justified, but she also fails to disclose in all her scoops that all her key witnesses are accused of bribery and fraud. One got funds from the crime, the other's in prison. So are you like a bad investigator or just a dishonest journalist? Because you people aren't acting as journalists or investigators. You people are actually spokesmen for a hostile regime, and you're well-financed, and that's why it's spooky. It's not kooky. It's a very big difference. Anyway, thank you very much. I put some uh, questions up here. First of all, uh, that's, that's defamation. Okay. I am not paid by the Russians at the moment. I'm not paid by anybody. So uh, that's, that's really defamation. But, you know, facts are really important. And there's actually, uh, there are several that you can check yourself. Okay. Uh, he put up on the PowerPoint the oversight uh, committee and said, it said that, um, that Magnitsky was tortured, that there were two lines there. Okay, Google, if you have something now, w, uh, <coughs> Wall Street Journal, uh, WSJ, uh, Public Oversight Commission, Magnitsky, and you will see there is no place in that report, no place where they say he was tortured. That's a total lie, and you can check Absolutely. it out right now. Wait a minute, the second part is the um, Human Rights Council uh, uh, that was, head was headed by Kabanov. So Kabanov has given a sworn deposition in a uh, U.S. federal court saying they uh, were preliminary findings based on a committee and the human rights, uh, uh, his organization never adopted it. That's a sworn deposition in U.S. federal court. Then he mentioned the um, Council of Europe. Well, that's interesting. William Pauley is the, has been the judge in the... Uh, the, uh, the, the case that we're all uh, uh, referring to in U.S. federal court. The Justice Department wanted to put that report into uh, in, in, to the trial. In order to put in evidence in a trial, you have to get the permission of the judge that it is relevant evidence. You just can't show up and say, oh, I have this really this great piece of evidence. So Pauli, in May of 2017, in rejecting the, the use of that said there doesn't ha appear to have been an actual hearing. He was referred to Brown as interference with the uh, work. He said uh, the report is replete with statements sympathetic to Magnitsky and Browder, including by individuals who were paid uh, and directed by Hermitage. He said Gross uh, said that he did not speak directly with persons uh, concerned about the Ill allegations. And also, uh, uh, Judge Pauley said Gross refused to appear for a deposition in this case, uh, saying he'd be humiliated. Uh, he said uh, he appears unable to stand behind and defend the report, which undermines the credibility and untrustworthiness of the report. In other words, quote, 
the gross report is some piece of work, and I mean that in hyperbole. So that's your, yeah. your evidence. And, uh, it's, the, a, it's, a, it's a judge. It's an American judge. It's a judge. It's not blah, blah, blah. It's, 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 it's the Prevazon case judge. His name is William Pauley III. And all of these uh, citations, by the way, are on, um, on, are on my uh, website. And one other thing, and then I'll give it over. Um, okay, so here's a journalist who obviously is paid not very well by the Russians because, <laughs> believe me, or is paid by, by very well by anybody. Uh, I might be living a different lifestyle. But, okay, so I'm a reporter, and you can believe me or not believe me. Let me tell you about my next story, and it's about something which I think you will believe. The NBC national security reporter in Washington is named Ken Delanian. If you watch TV in the U.S., you see Ken Delanian a lot. He did a major investigation of Browder. Uh, based on his evidence, he determined Browder was a fraud. The Magnitsky story was a fraud. How do I know about this? There was a hack of the emails of a guy named Robert Otto, the State Department guy in, in intelligence and research that deals with Russia. By the way, intelligence doesn't mean he's a spy, which some people have said. It just means uh, this is information. It's that kind of intelligence. So these uh, emails, uh, Bra Browder included uh, Robert Otto in the loop of all of uh, his emails dealing with this question with Delanian. So that's how I can read all the emails, all it's lovely to be able to see stuff that they didn't think anybody else would see. He said, um, in, so he is saying April 25th in 2017, Mr. Browder, uh, could you answer some questions? Uh, there are allegations you concocted the story of Magnitsky as a whistleblower to cover up your own alleged tax fraud. Uh, our own analysis has found that English translations of documents on sites linked to you do not match the original Russian on key points. For example, there is no evidence that Magnitsky was severely beaten just before his death, as you have uh, described. Could you let me know whether you're willing to discuss this? Then he sends written questions and uh, talks about the whole issue of being a whistleblower, and he said, um, he, and he challenges that, and he said, such facts would have upended the justification for the Magnitsky Act, would show Browder's claims to be a lie. They would cast a very different light on the visit to Donald Trump Jr. Uh, more than a month later. Uh, he, because what happened was, uh, he was ready to go with a very damning story, which pretty much says everything I say, except it was a year and a half before me. If that had come out, I wouldn't have had a story. The story would have been out on NBC TV, which gets a lot more attention than 100 reporters. He said everything. And what's really funny is after my report came out, uh, I was surprised, he sent out a tweet to his followers telling him to read my article because it was so good. So what happens? He is about to run with this. Uh, in the emails, uh, Robert Otto is talking to other uh, officials, State Department people, he, and he's also talking about Andre's film. He said, well, I'm not that worried about Andre's film. I'm really worried about Ken Delanian's story. All of these are in the emails. And so what happens? He, is t he finally, Browder is not answering or else he's giving him a lot of lies, which uh, Delanian is coming back and saying, you said this and this and this, but it's not true, it's not true. Um, so what happens? He's about to go with this, with this explosive, ex explosive expose, and Cobra and Kim, three of their lawyers are here, sends a law threatening lawyer's letter to NBC, and I have that too. And NBC kills the story. Month later, you have the Trump Tower meeting where uh, the, the lawyer, Veselnitskaya, is talking about that the Browder and the Magnitsky case, it's all a fraud. If that report had come out one month before, there would have been no need for that meeting. It would have been all over the, the uh, airwaves, all over the papers. Ken Delanian is a really important guy. He's a very solid, he had uh, very solid information. Cobra and Kim uh, killed the story. I, I'm a little suspicious about why NBC did that. That's owned by Comcast, worth a couple of billion. Browder has stolen a lot of money, but he doesn't have that much money. My suspicion is the State Department really cared. We can see that by um, the emails that, that Robert Otto sent. I think there were some higher level uh, interests in the establishment uh, that really wanted 
this uh, Cold War 2.0 fable to go along. I, th I have no evidence. I think that's why uh, he killed the story. But uh, that, that is uh, why uh, the Trump Tower meeting continued. Suppose it hadn't happened. Suppose this expose had come out. No Trump Tower meeting, probably. Uh, no, uh, there would be no Paul Manafort there. Uh, there would be no Mueller investigation. Think of everything that would have changed uh, if this story had, had gone through and if, uh, the, uh, if, if Browder's law firm, Cobra and Kim, hadn't sent this threatening letter and if NBC hadn't ca caved. Now, the other thing that's happening is this story is on lockdown in the U.S. Nobody wants to print this story, even though it's solid. There's a guy at the Washington Post who's in charge of, on a high level, making sure their stories are honest. He says, I know the Browder story is a fake. I'm trying to get them to write the truth. So I sent him this story. He sent it around to editors. They don't want to touch it. Uh, I talked to uh, Huffington Post. They said, oh, we don't have the people to, to check the documents. The documents are so solid. So this is what's happening in the US. There is a real problem. The same people who have written the, the fake stories about the Browder, Magnitsky story, are, are now on lockdown on a Kendallanian story, really tough. So listen, there's a lot of journalists here. Any of your uh, papers or media want to run this story? It is totally documented, completely documented. And I think this would blow the, this whole fake Browder Magnitsky story out of the water. Yeah, okay. Great. So uh, I'm afraid what uh, Jameson did is, is what's done all the time. You know, this avalanche of claims no documents except for PowerPoint presentations. Veselnitska, the Russian lawyer, had nothing, you know, uh, she, she didn't find it. My film is completely independent. My film is a Western film, no penny from Russia. Norwegian uh, Film Institute, Norwegian television, German, French television. You know, we call, we're talking about, you know, mainstream public uh, organizations, Arte, you know, all a long list. Uh, no, you know, what, what proof we, have, we are in the pocket of Putin, or, uh, you know, let alone Lucy. Uh, there are very specific questions here. I'm, I, made, I, I couldn't finish, unfortunately, but, and, and I, I was going to address the, the fact that uh, these gentlemen claim that they complained. On the one hand, they say, why, it's, it's police, why complain to the police? But they did complain, quote, unquote, but it was a typical red herring. They, they claim, now they claim the companies were stolen. What the, you know, the translation of the document, uh, the, 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 the third of uh, December document, there were a few, uh, which they, they, they say was a criminal complaint. It's not a criminal complaint. It's not a proper criminal, it's, it's a kind of red herring, very confusing letter about an attempt you, you have to read it in English. It's, it's all there, uh, uh, open sources. An attempt to steal money from them, to steal money from them, the money which wasn't actually there because Browder told me it removed all money because police, police couldn't do anything. He says police did nothing. The, the only proof Magnitsky was a whistleblower, we're talking, the, the, w w what, what is this story about? Go to the Wikipedia, what is the story? W what is the heavy artil artillery in, uh, of Browder's sort of argument? They killed a whistleblower. That's what people care about. They don't, you know, it's impossible. You can go forever. We, we have to have a court case if we want, a proper court case if we want to study all the documents. The, 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 the reason people believe Browder is because a, a guy was killed in a Russian prison, a whistleblower, you, you know, who report, investigated, reported the crime. He did not, not a shred of evidence Magnitsky investigated, reported. He couldn't produce, uh, Jameson couldn't produce anything. But the, the two, it's also the open source, the two documents Browder claims as a proof of Magnitsky b being a whistleblower are police interrogations. Police interrogation, minutes of police interrogating Magnitsky. Who, what whistleblower, nothing else, nothing else at all. You know, you go into Wikipedia, here's among is Snowden, uh, Chelsea Manning, who, you know, who leaked something. There must be a body of work. Where's the body of work of Magnitsky? Two investigations. The police was investigating, not Magnitsky. Before, they started before, you know, they uh, obviously, yeah. So 
Uh, well, and, uh, no, j no, sorry, no, just, hold, hold on, just, just let me no, finish. No, 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 wait a minute. No, just let this me finish. This is not a lecture theatre. Okay. People okay. here want to ask questions, yeah. okay. not be lectured by you. Okay. You've okay. had a shot. Okay. People no. want to ask well, questions. Okay. Okay. Well, ask, well, ask, a, qu ask a question. Ask a question. Ask a question. First one is to Lucy, yeah? It does surprise me as you as a well, journalist. Let, 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 let him ask let a question. No, you can ask. When you answer a question, you can say No, but he asked a question to Lucy, yeah? You as a journalist complained about being defamed. It's strange for a journalist that doesn't mind dishing it out but can't take it. Now, I'll tell you the uh -uh. problem here okay. with Browder is the minute you squeak, Browder's got 20 lawyers on you all the time. And the simple facts of life are no newspaper that are run by suits want to have a long, long war with Browder. That's why stories don't get told about Browder. That's How the come he didn't truth. sue me? How come he has okay. never but, sued me? But, but this, is, th this is important, but this is technical. Can I, can I finish on the substance? We're, we're talking this. So there's absolutely the, the hoax, just, just the very fact that Magnitsky wasn't a whistleblower is enough to throw this story because that's what the, the, the US law, all this was based, it, uh, is based on this. The Magnitsky, it's the called Magnitsky Act. Why that Magnitsky Act? You know, this is not, I'm not, I, I said on the record, I was the critic of the Russian government, not Browder. And I can go on and criticize, and, and there could be some laws, it's, but it's nothing to do with Magnitsky. Magnitsky is a Br Browder's red herring. Just, just one more thing. The, the uh, Andreas Gross, which, you know, sometimes people kind of who are more kind of um, mild mannered, let's say, than James, he said, okay, well, Browder may, may have got something wrong, but there's some independence. It's not, it, it doesn't all come from Browder, basically, they say. Look, let's look calmly at independent sources. And one of the big independent sources are supposed to be this, uh, the, the only uh, investigation in the West. The, the in-depth investigation by Andreas Gross, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. A Swiss guy, you know, obviously you can't suspect him to be pro-Russian. And he actually, he, he, did, he didn't like my film at all because, because I asked him a few questions on, on the record. But what, 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 does, what did he tell me on the record? And that's in the film. Magnitsky was not murdered. And this is the guy who actually is, is a, this, this American judge, Paulie, he, he, th he thinks he was very pro-Browder. We're talking about someone who is pro-Browder and, who, and whom Jameson quotes. But he told me on the record, Magnitsky was not murdered. The, the uh, Physicians for Human Rights, the organization, uh, which, which I, I, th I think Browder commissioned, did not mention the beating. They did not mention the beating. So I can go on forever. But Any questions? Question. Over here. Go ahead, go ahead. Go yeah, right, okay. Bottom line in that PowerPoint what? was, and Andre, how did you and the Galitsky talk? Huh. Yeah, and why did and why did you start? Well, could you just just just? Oh, sure, sure. I absolutely. Like Where is the money transfer? I'd like just show us the proof. Sorry, oh, money transfer. Where, 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 where is the proof that Andre's film was financed? That's not what I said. Yeah. That's not and what I said. Let me let me clarify. The screen. Yeah, okay. The, the the screening of his film, the venue, the event. Okay, was financed unquestionably by the NGO. Well, I had no idea. I had no idea. Well, where, the proof? I had no idea. I don't have it with me, but, but you know but, we can put it all. Well, up you don't there. have a proof well, 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 as, as, as for anything. Well, nothing. Wait, shut up a minute. Right. That's the most serious allegation to me that that. That, that, that movie has been financed. Well, no, no, that no, 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 no. I didn't you're say confused, you're confusing. I said the, I said the yeah. venue, yeah. the, the yeah. event, like oh. this event, right? No, no, if, we had, yeah. if we financed the screening for Andre, if we rented the hotel room and paid for the stuff so he could come in and show us, so no, that's no, what was financed. You know, no, 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 Philip, nobody's alleging that she financed or partially financed the film. And I would say that... that Andre's film, I think um, he really, really struggled for it to be shown anywhere because because of uh, uh, pressure, pressure, I'm assuming, right? So, so, you know, he made a film, and he was struggling to have it shown anywhere. And quite frankly, I'm in favor of, uh, you know, films being shown, you know, pro this, anti that, you know. Uh, you know, I'm in favor of free speech myself. So, you know, they, I, I know independently that uh, he was having trouble having anyone show his film. There was pressure not to have the film shown. So it's not, you know difficult to believe that 
you know, somebody with, you know, we've all got some vested interest in everything, right? We're all motivated by something. I'm motivated by money to put on this conference, you know. You know. But, 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 yeah. so, so, so the Milet. answer to the question Milet. is, when did she start financing the movie? She didn't Long finance the movie. Nobody's okay. alleging yeah. she okay. financed the movie. You're confusing right. financing you a movie okay. with I paying to have the movie shown. I should have said finance the, the screenings right. of your movies. Okay. I apologize. Then nobody is saying she financed the movie. You've no, literally he's invented he's it. It's actually correct that I, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't okay. say okay. screenings okay. of so your that movies. That statement needs some no. correction. So yep. where is the proof? Screening. That, I agree. Where is the proof that the screening was financed? Who cares, though? Well, well, I mean, but, but, he, but he says well, that he says no, that, and he, no, he, but I he, think it's he accuses. Well, he did uh, he did accuse um, um, us both, but specifically of of, of just being uh, in the pockets of Putin and and, and re, 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 repeating repeating uh, Russian story. Nobody in Russia made a film like this. And one one question I said, why people ask me why if if if, if Putin uh, hates Browder so much, why did he didn't commission a film? Well, they well he didn't. Maybe maybe Russians are bad communicators. That's a problem. I don't know. They, I, I totally disagree with 99% with of content, including what they say about Browder and Russian television. But, but nothing, nothing of the kind. They, it's, it's, it's incoherent, and I, as I said, I disagree. They, they, they call Browder. I don't know, by the way. But, but, but there's no proof they call Browder an, an asset, a CIS asset, influencing Russian opposition. It does that, by the way. But, I, I, but it's, it's a very crude kind of content. Nobody did this film. I did not repeat. I, I, did, I did write. I did write. My producer wrote to the Russian uh, prosecutor asking for some documents. And we wrote to a lot of people. There was no reply. Not only there was, there was no penny of it. We had no reply, no cooperation, no documents. All the documents I have in the film are from the open sources. And this is misingenuous. Yes, we all have an agenda. But I must say, in my defense, uh, you know, less me and, and Lucy. I wasn't only doing my job, only doing my journalistic job. These people do have a vested interest. You're talking. You are hearing from a protagonist of that story, a protagonist of that story. And Browder, I, I, I told you, the timeline, he was first investigated and, in Russia and then became uh, the uh, uh, number Putin, uh, Putin's enemy. Magnitsky was, uh, the police first investigated the case and then only then they interrogated him and that interrogation absolutely, incredibly actually, is, is, is called a proof of him being a whistleblower, which is absolute nonsense. It just, just on that, on this little speech of mine, the Magnitsky Act should be really looked at some, at, 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 as the Judge Pauli said, as some piece of work, the Magnitsky Law. And, and where in the um, mature, if you don't mind me saying so, the journalist history, is there any evidence of Russian meaning or that she's been bought before? Yeah, well, tell me how I was bought and how much yeah. did I get. Where, where, where's the transfer oh, no, from I'm this not, lady? I'm not actually saying she's bought. What I'm saying is, look, how can you actually give a whole presentation just now and write a whole series of articles and not mention that your guy's in jail? That your star witness is in jail for ripping off a billion bucks from Ikea. What I'm saying is, I'm not accusing her of taking money. What I'm accusing her of doing is a different exercise. It's not journalism. I am talking, I was talking with Where's two people who admitted who they were knowledgeable, in one case, the Andrei Pavlov, in, in a bit of corruption. So the fact they may end up in jail for something else does not surprise me. That's you know, when, when you get evidence from crooks, if they do something else that's crooked, well, this is not surprising. But the point is, the evidence is what counts. You have to counter, word, counter the evidence, uh, and the evidence and is out there. And, and, it's and documented. Frankly, and frankly, you have double standards. Ponomarev is in jail. I know Ponomarev too. And Ponomarev considers himself now as a dissident. You know, he writes me letters. You know, maybe I, I, I can't reveal everything because he's in the, he's in the Russian custody. He considers himself as a, as a fighter against Russian corruption, just like Magnitsky. So you have double standards. Sometimes, you, sometimes, Wait, you use, sometimes, sometimes you use Russian documents, by the way, out of context, you know, and then you say the, 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 the Russia is totally controlled, completely controlled, uh, and, and Magnitsky was, uh, you know, in jail, and Ponomaryov is in jail, uh, like, like what? It, it means that he is guilty. Then you have to choose. The logic, um, uh, 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 either you trust the Russian justice and everything, you know, or you don't. Okay. I, well, I only have one thing to say. Right. Right. Sweet. Oh, 
You know, we can sit here and go, this document, that document, nobody's got any documents in front of them. So let's cut to the chase, right? Why does all the money from the crime go to Russian officials and their friends? Why isn't it coming to me and Browder? You, you haven't proven okay. it. You haven't proven it. I'm sorry, four different or, si or six different European and American jurisdictions have frozen money, okay? And, and, frozen, and I, but not in court. The only court you had in New York, you lost. There's no proof. No, we didn't lose. You settled. You settled well, without. Settled. It's settled, but the government, if the government. Andrea, you don't want to answer the question, why doesn't the money come to us? I, 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 End I, I, of story. Why isn't Russia looking for the money? You can, I mean, th your whole tactic is to get in this document, that document, and nobody's got one. You went to Andreas Gross and you said, what if all the information came from Hermitage? He goes, what? Right? Because he's not like sitting on his documents right now. They looked right at now. the money. You know, you don't damn well. And they froze Andrea, the money. You look. You, you answer you, my question. Why doesn't the money well, he come said, to us? He's asking the question, why are Russia? aren't looking for the money, and I said they did, and you know damn well they did, and they froze the money in Russian. Uh, uh, show, me, show me one well, request yeah. for money. Show me one request to foreign banks coming out from the Russian money. The, the, there the are requests. Uh, you know, uh, come on. You no, know, no, find them. We I want just, you to we're talking about Magnitsky. Okay. The, we're talking uh, about uh, the Russian can, government me, tracing me answer, $230 million me, dollars stolen from its treasury, it's and in if the it's film. not looking, it's in the film. there's something let wrong. Answer. Let me answer. In, in the film, okay, in the film, in the film, we, we, we can't see now, there's a very clear description of how uh, Mr. Browder traced the money, and, and, you, and you know that, you've seen the film. There's a, an agent, an American government agent, and the American government in the Previson case, it's the only case basically who went to court because you can say uh, uh, you know you start an investigation you start investigations and then like in France police drop that investigation in the in the Dansky case by the way you have the, you, they have this PR machine they we start investigation but when it comes to court hearing the only one was Previson and in, in Previson and I have it in the film the um, American American government investigation uh, agent says we, we took all our information from Browder we took all our information from Browder you know, watch the film. If the government, if the government fails in such a way, if the government is manipulated by Browder, and, and in those emails, Robert Otto, the, the Lucy mentioned, or Robert Otto says very clearly, we are all parts of the PR machine of Browder. A government, uh, a, a higher, you know, State Department official admits, concedes that the U.S. government is in the pocket of Browder. That's very worrying. This is not a Russian story. Let me, let me this, is a, this is a very Western story of a, of a, of a, so, of a real um, crisis. Andre, let, let me add to that because it's what, it's what you're saying. And it's interesting because I don't know if he's here now, uh, but uh, what, uh, the person, his name was Todd Hyman, and he was the chief investigator for the Justice Department in the Previson case. And he gave a deposition, and the person that questioned him was John Moscow, who may or be, may be in the audience or maybe not, but he's been at this conference. And so uh, uh, Todd Hyman, uh, he asked him, where did you get your information? You know, you're starting the case with the information. Oh, we got it from Browder. And and, on, and from the internet, we got our information came from Browder and the internet. And some of this information was about money uh, transfers, money moving back and forth. And so uh, John Moscow said, okay, we went between the, that was also, that came from Browder. So, he, so John Moscow says to uh, Todd Hyman, well, um, so did you contact the banks to find out whether this information was actually accurate with, with these real transfers? And Hyman says, uh, no, we didn't. They were foreign banks. And John Mo Moscow says, really? Does your phone go long distance? That's, that, that is the basis and, of the And, and in, of the the film, case. in the film, I show that the Russians did investigate those money flows. And, there was an, and, and the first investigation by uh, not Jameson Feistan, but the organi organization who Browder admits worked with him, OCCRP, and the Russian opposition newspaper, Nova Gazeta, did get it, by the way, from the Russian investigation. A certain Mr. Gorokhov uh, uh, photographed that in, in Russia. He, he brought this, this information from America. Russian police money flow uh, done by an uh, officer called Uzumtsev. You know, there's a long list of companies and a long list of banks, what, what the journalists who work with Browder do, they then con concoct a, a, a story, a simplified version, they put a chart, but even from that chart, I didn't know that before, from the, you know, what I, what I mentioned about, about the, you know, the, the source being Russian police, it, it also was revealed in the Previson case, but, but, what, but, but even, looking, even looking at that chart for the kind of, for the people, you know, it, but clearly it didn't end up because 
is, you know, like about eight, 80 million people, if it's 230 million, that chart was 80 million, 80 million, sort of leaves the scam companies, goes, goes, goes everywhere. In the middle, there's 300 million. And then it flows out and, and the, uh, the, the, the defendant in the Previson case gets something like 800,000. What nine makes nine. you, what makes you, uh, where's the proof if the money goes through this uh, 300 million uh, dollars, which is obviously mean, means it's mixed. So you can only kind of claim with PowerPoint presentation, but when it goes to court case, you cannot prove it. And that's, unfortunately, Jameson, is, is the truth. <laughs> Wait a minute, we have to say one more thing. Thank you to David Marchand, because this event is the first uh, mainstream important event to hear this cr critical side of this story and, uh, and, and Dave really has to be commended for that because no place else has this meeting taken place. Well done. Thank you very much. It's, it's very courageous. I, I'll, I'll tell you, German, Germ, the German television boss, I can tell you on the record, German television boss of, of ZDF told me, because we were in, the, in, the, in Brussels, in the European Parliament, he said, you know, I'm afraid, I'm, you know, I can't take responsibility, this guy will b basically sue us for millions and millions and millions. ZDF, so you, you, you've done better than that. Thank you. Um, okay, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, the next Offshore Alert conference will be in Miami on April the 28th to the 30th. We're holding one in Sao Paulo, Brazil in September of next year, and then London again, hopefully, at this hotel next, well, 12 months' time. Thank you all. Have safe travels. Thank you.